In the previous lecture, we introduced a number of concepts about hydrodynamic bearings, and we want to go just a little bit further in this lecture. And we're showing now a fully developed hydrodynamic lubrication for a shaft shown here that is spinning clockwise, and it has developed a full hydrodynamic film lubrication. And we mentioned before that it moves from the center of the two concentric bearing and shaft locations down and to the left for clockwise rotation by a distance E. And there is a region of closest approach here, which is given by the symbol H0. And we want to make absolutely sure that any dirt particles that are in our fluid lubricant are smaller than the distance H0 so that we can have a thick, stable lubricating film. So this minimum film thickness H0 is important. The eccentricity ratio, epsilon, is given by this distance E divided by the clearance, which we originally designed into the bearing. I mentioned previously that you do not necessarily have to embrace the entire shaft with a bushing. Instead, you could use some arc beta. A full bearing has beta equal to 360. Degrees. Now, the hydrodynamic theory was really developed by Beauchamp Tower in the 1880s, and in this theory, Tower tried to sort out what the actual pressure distribution was along the supported side of a journal bearing. And what he found is the following, and that is there is a parabolic pressure distribution if you section through the axis of rotation. That's this shown on the right. And there is another parabolic distribution along the axis axial length L of your journal bearing. So we want to get a better handle on what that parabolic distribution looks like. Reynolds decided that all we need to do is instead of worrying about the polar geometry of this, if you recognize that the film is relatively thin, thin compared to the radius of curvature of the shaft, then you simply treat a local region of the shaft as a wedge-shaped moving slider. And then you know that the lubricant is flowing in from the right side through and out of the left side. And since we are squeezing that lubricant down, we know that the pressure is going to be changing as we move along through the lubricated region of the journal. Now there's an XY coordinate system drawn onto this figure with X pointing positively to the left, Y pointing up, and Z pointing into the page. And so if you were to look at a small material element of dimensions DX and DY, and you sorted out the pressure that were acting on that element, you could determine the change in pressure as a function of location x and y through the film. Now what we know is on the right hand side, we start with a pressure p, we multiply that by the cross-sectional area dy dx, and that gives us a force that's pointing to the left, which is in this case the positive x direction. But that pressure is going to be changing as we move from the right side to the left side, and that pressure is going to be P plus the change in pressure with respect to the X, X direction, again, multiplied by DX, and then the cross-sectional area is dy dx. We also have a shear stress on the bottom side, multiplied by a cross-sectional area, and that shear stress is changing as we move to the top side, and the change is the partial of tau with respect to y times dy, so tau plus that times the cross-sectional area, determines the magnitude of the force in the direction to the left as we move from bottom to top. When we add all of those forces up, we're saying that they must be equal to zero. And if you do that, and noting that those forces that point to the left are positive, we find that the change in pressure as we move in the x direction is equal to the partial derivative of the shear stress with respect to y. Now, we also know that the shear stress is related to the dynamic viscosity through the derivative of the velocity with respect respect to location y. And we said that once the film is fully developed, we simply have the velocity u divided by the film thickness 
H as that derivative. That's what it would be for a Newtonian fluid. So if we take this tau and plug it into the equation up above, we find that the change in pressure with respect to the x direction is equal to the dynamic viscosity times the second partial derivative of the velocity with respect to the y direction. So we're using partials here because the velocity of the fluid as we move from the right side to the left side is going to be increasing. So the velocity is a function of x and the fluid velocity is also going to be a function of y because it's zero at this wall and that it is equal to capital U at the upper wall. And so we have a partial derivative, a second partial of that velocity function with respect to y in the equation down here. So we can solve that equation with respect to y and we get a velocity profile function that looks like this with two constants of integration and it varies with location y as we move from top to bottom and it depends upon the derivative of the pressure with respect to x. So if we solve that equation, we get this right here. And so what we see is that our velocity distribution has a parabolic term and a linear term. And so if we think about what's happening with the pressure, the change in pressure with respect to x, we know that as we move from the right side over here to the left side, that the pressure is going to be increasing. It's going to reach a maximum at the location of pr closest approach, and then it's going to decrease again. So it's going to be positive and increasing as we enter the hydrodynamic bearing. It's going to reach a maximum, and then it is going to fall off. And so we can evaluate this velocity distribution for dp dx greater than zero, which is as we are moving into the region of closest approach, dp dx equal to zero, which is at the location of closest approach between the journal and the bushing. And then for a gradient, uh, a change in pressure with respect to x less than zero, that's as we're coming back out the other side. And so what we find is that the velocity distribution is going to be parabolic as we're moving into the location of closest approach. Once we get to the location of closest approach, it's linear. And then as we move past it, it becomes parabolic in the other direction. And so what this means is simply we have a convergence of the fluid through the smallest distance of closest approach, and then it diverges again once we move past that. The other thing that we care about is the fluid flow, which is a fluid flux through the bearing, and we can solve equations. Again, Reynolds did that. Let's not worry too much about that. Uh, but we are going to be looking at a number of these things as we move forward. But there are a number of design guidelines that we want to use for designing journal bearing. The minimum film thickness, H0, to prevent the accumulation of surface particles. The minimum thickness, H0, is equal to some offset plus some value times your shaft diameter. You are recommended to keep the temperatures below 250 degrees Fahrenheit. The maximum starting load to limit wear at startup is just equal to your static load when you are just turning the shaft on and just beginning to rotate it, divided by the journal length times the shaft diameter. So you could use this particular equation if you have already chosen a shaft diameter for infinite life. You can choose the journal length based upon the required load that it must carry. Keep it below 300 PSI, and people have found that works well. And then use a design factor of two. Now, a number of charts were put together that can be used to evaluate things like the absolute viscosity as a function of temperature. There is a absolute viscosity, again, as a function of temperature in degrees C, figure 12.13, and figure 12.14, where we have the viscosity for multi-weight motor oils. We alluded a short while ago to the fact that the pressure distribution was parabolic, and the maximum pressure occurs at some some location, if this bearing is rotating clockwise, you're drawing fluid in, it's being compressed, it reaches a location where you maximize the pressure, and then it moves through and gets spit out the backside. Well, it also leaks, 
out of the edges, by the way. Now, I said that the maximum pressure was going to be at the location of closest approach, but that's not actually true. Turns out it's off a little bit from that. And the angle for the maximum pressure, th theta P max, is shown here. We have a phi, which locates the region of closest approach. And then we have an angle that locates the termination of the parabolic pressure distribution that is acting to resist the loads that are applied through the shaft. So the minimum film thickness, which will be associated with H0, is given in this chart, where the minimum film thickness is a dimensionless parameter of H0 divided by C. You know the clearance. You're the designer. You can pick off the H0 if you know your Sommerfeld number, and you are bound to know that because you know the dynamic viscosity. You know the speed at which you're using your shaft. You know the pressure that you need to carry. You know the radius of your shaft, and you know the clearance that you designed into it. And so you can use that Sommerfeld number to locate for different L over D ratios, where L is the length of the journal and D is the shaft diameter. You can determine the minimum film thickness. You can also determine the position phi of that minimum film thickness, again, versus the Sommerfeld number using figure 1217 for different L over D ratios. You can also find coefficient of friction as a function of the Sommerfeld number for different L over D ratios. And you can find the flow variable from figure 1219 and the flow ratio of side flow to total flow from figure 1220. There's lots of things you can do. The other interesting one is the maximum film pressure, which is given by figure 1221. And then we have a temperature increase chart, which is also given as a function of the Sommerfeld number. We can use all of these charts to solve problems, and that's what we will do next. We're going to do an example problem to show you how you can use the charts that are in the Shigley design book. And the example problem we'll do is the following. I'm asking you to find H0, that is the closest approach between shaft and the bushing, as well as the offset distance E, if a designer has already told me that the dynamic viscosity is 4 micro ren, this shaft is rotating at 30 revs per second, we are carrying 500 pound load, the shaft radius is 0.75 inches, the clearance is 0.0015 inches, and the journal length is 1.5 inches. So in order for me to enter the charts, I always need that Sommerfeld ratio, which is going to be R over C squared times the dynamic viscosity times N over P. And so before I can actually use those charts, there's a couple of things that I have to do. First, I have to figure out R over C. Well, I know that my shaft radius is 0 0.75 inches, and I know that my clearance as designed was 0 0.0015 inches. And if you take that ratio, you end up with an R over C value of 500. The pressure P is just going to be given by the weight that I must carry divided by the projected area, which is twice the radius times the length of the journal. So that is simply going to be 500 pounds divided by twice R, that's 1.5, times L, that's 1.5. And so I end up with a pressure of 222 PSI. Now, this micro ren equal to 4 times 10 to the minus 6 PSI second. And our Sommerfeld number, when we plug everything in that we just sorted out, is going to be this 500 squared times my dynamic viscosity, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 6 PSI seconds. I multiply that by 30 rest per second. I divide all of that by my pressure, which was 222 PSI, and you see that this becomes a dimensionless number. My Sommerfeld number is 0.135. So now we are going to go to figure 1216 to sort out film thickness variable H0 divided by the clearance C as a function of Sommerfeld number. We found that our Sommerfeld number was 0.135. 1, 
three, five. I know that my L over D ratio is 1.5 over 1.5, so it's one. We're looking at this curve right in here. And so if you look carefully at that, our by 0.13, I come up here, it's on the order of H0 over C is equal to 0 0.42. So my H0 over C from figure 1216 is going to be equal to 0 0.42. So my H0 is 0 0.42 times 0 0.0015 inches, which gives me a pretty tiny number of H0 equal to 0 0.0. 0, 0, 0, 0.00063 inches. That's pretty small. And so you're going to need a good filter on your lubricant to keep dirt out of that particular gap, or we're going to be generating lots of scoring of the shaft and the bushing. Now, the other thing that we have to do is find the eccentricity. Now we want to find this offset E, which represents how much the shaft has moved. So let's take a quick peek. We have this shaft that has moved from its original original position here to a new position there. And along that line, we now have a distance H0. And so we used to have a distance all the way out to C, which is our clearance. Which And so it turns out that this offset E is just going to be given by the difference between C and H0. That's going to be equal to E. And our eccentricity ratio is given given as E over C. And so if we take this equation right here and divide everything by C, we have 1 minus H0 over C is equal to E over C, which is just my eccentricity ratio. Using the Sommerfeld number, we, we determined that H0 over C is 0 0.42. And so 1 minus H0 over C is going to be equal to 0 0.58. And so E over over C is equal to 0 0.58. E is going to be equal to 0 0.58 times 0 0.0015 inches. And this is going to give me an E value of 0 0.00087 inches. It doesn't move very far. The next thing that we would like to do is find, let's say, the coefficient of friction. We can use table 1218 to find the coefficient of friction for this Sommerfeld number. So R over C times my coefficient of friction is given as a function of the Sommerfeld number. We already know what the Sommerfeld number is. We know that we're on the L over D equal 1 line. We know that our Sommerfeld number is 0 0.13. Five. So we're coming up here, which tells us that R over C times the coefficient of friction is equal to roughly 3.6. And so our coefficient of friction is going to be equal to 3.6 times 0 0.0015 divided by 0 0.75 inches. And that gives me a coefficient of friction of 0 0.0072. That is a pretty low coefficient of friction. And this is an example of how you can use the charts to extract information for your particular journal bearing.